Hello, it's Adam again, and today we are going to be covering the next section of endocrinology. This will be part two of two. This is going to be covering more of a kind of hodgepodge of items uh, as compared to our more uh, focused approach with um, diabetes in the last lecture, but here we go. First thing we'll talk about just briefly is going to be hyperprolactinemia. Um, just to kind of get acquainted with a few of the drugs, um, some of which we've talked about previously. Um, usually uh, when you see hyperprolactinemia develop, it's going to be in relation to uh, these prolactin secreting tumors. So you can have either adenomas, microadenomas. Um, some of the, the problems of this with having too much prolactin around can include things like galactorrhea, uh, amenorrhea or impotence. Um, and also infertility. So um, obviously some I people have issues with this and, and getting pregnant and so you can actually see some of these being used to help kind of stimulate um, ovulation and uh, eventual conception. The way that we're going to treat hyperprolactinemia is by administering dopamine agonist and so this is um, this kind of makes sense based on what we've talked about before we talked about antipsychotics and how those are um, you know, varying degrees of potency at blocking dopamine 2 receptors and we know that when we block those dopamine receptors we're going to see a uh, tip in the balance towards producing more prolactin and here's the same thing so if you end up having a case of having too much prolactin um, we can try stimulating the dopamine receptors more and that will help kind of bring that back into balance so the two drugs you're going to see being used here most often would be uh, bromocryptine uh, Bromocryptin, you know, we mentioned before when we talked about neuroleptic malignant syndrome as a way to uh, agonize those receptors and try to bring dopamine um, dopamine transmission kind of back to normal. Um, and then we also have uh, cabergoline. Um, this has a little bit higher affinity, um, but also have a few other issues related to it. Um, the big thing to note here is that these are ergot alkaloids, and I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but the ergot alkaloids um, are derived from a fungus. And so if you've ever heard of St. Anthony's fire, um, that's kind of the big example of where ergots came from. Usually what would happen when you had these ergots infecting rye and they made bread out of it, this is you know, kind of back in medieval times, um, they would end up eating the bread that was infected and these ergots would cause all sorts of issues. So um, mainly being really sympathomimetic, they would cause a lot of vasoconstriction. So by agonizing those alpha receptors, they would really kind of clamp down on the blood vessels. And so you would get this like kind of burning kind of sensation. You could eventually get gangrene from lack of perfusion of the, the distal um, fingers and also toes um, would be a big issue. So because of this burning sensation, uh, it was called... Um, we kind of described as kind of a firelight condition. Um, and then there was also a lot of CNS effects with it. So people would have hallucinations and have seizures and all kinds of bad problems with it. So they, you know, back in the day before they really had science, they just assumed that this was some sort of, um, uh, you know, demonic infliction. And so they would actually go on these um, pilgrimages over to St. Anthony's Cathedral in order to pray there. And what they noticed was the further away they got from their homes with the infected rye, um, the better they got because, again, they weren't being exposed to these ergots anymore. Um, so they entitled that St. Anthony's Fire um, whenever you had exposure to these um, ergots. But what we did realize is that you can utilize these ergot derivatives in a number of different conditions where either dopamine agonism is going to be useful or um, you need to have some vasoconstriction. So you'll see these ergots kind of pop up again when we talk about migraines towards the end of the semester. But the big thing to note here is that you're going to see issues with blood pressure in a lot of cases, especially if you have a little bit higher than therapeutic doses. And then you're also going to see some nausea and vomiting with these agents. And then uh, the other thing with the CNS effects is definitely you're going to see things like headache, dizziness, fatigue, um, associated with these agents uh, in particular. Moving on, uh, then we'll talk about androgens. I know we talked uh, quite a bit about uh, estrogens and progestins before, so uh, time to give uh, the gentlemen in, in the class our, our due. So looking at the production of a lot of these uh, natural steroids that we have, we note that, and if I can get my laser pointer out, we know that um, you start off with, with basically cholesterol, and that can be broken down into lots of different kind of compounds. You'll notice here that progesterones are going to be the main things that are produced from cholesterol, and then that can be turned into all sorts of other things. So, you know, we know progestin has some androgenic effects. We know it has some mineralocorticoid effects, and that makes sense because we see it being converted over into things like aldosterone, cortisol, and the big thing we want to focus on here is the fact that the, these uh, progesterones also get converted over te uh, to testosterone, being one of the major androgens that's going to be um, produced uh, in males. 
So this process here, this conversion over, and then eventual conversion uh, to estradiol, this is going to be mediated by um, the aromatase enzyme. And so we, we talked about in um, some degree of talking about breast cancer and things like that, that you can actually inhibit um, the conversion of androgens over to uh, estrogen-based compounds for those estrogen-based uh, cancers um, by using aromatase inhibitors. Uh, so you'll certainly see some effects um, here when we talk about those. So testosterone, as we said, it's one of the most important androgens made uh, in the testes uh, specifically. Now we make about eight milligrams uh, per day. And one of the big things uh, that happens is when you produce the testosterone, testosterone really isn't the major active player here. Um, what happens is it gets acted on by an enzyme called 5-alpha uh, reductase. And this converts it over to dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. And that's going to have a lot more potent androgenic activity than you normally would see with just uh, testosterone by itself. So this is really the big active player. And when we talk about things like uh, BPH and things like that, you'll notice that 5-alpha um, reductase inhibitors are going to be a big thing because the, the dihydrotestosterone is, is just so potent at agonizing those androgen receptors. We'll also note that testosterone itself is converted to estradiol by aromatase, and we just mentioned that briefly, um, you know, where that's uh, going to be important in certain cancers and, and um, things like that. Now, testosterone is going to be metabolized in the liver, and this is going to be important when we talk about some of the agents and, and testosterone derivatives that are given orally, because we know that, you know, after the GI tract, the liver is going to be the first organ that really these drugs are going to hit. So there's going to be some pretty significant uh, effects on the liver uh, when it's being exposed to things like testosterone. And then once the drug is absorbed and sends systemic circulation or it's been produced in the body and, and gets to systemic circulation, um, what they're going to do is, is very similar to what we saw with uh, both glucocorticoids and also um, things like uh, estrogens and progestins. They're going to be moving intracellularly. By doing that, they're going to get into the cell, go to the nucleus, and work on these androgen receptors. And by doing that, you're going to see things um, being changed in as far as gene transcription goes. So new proteins are going to be synthesized. Cells are going to be either uh, be growing or differentiating based on its exposure to uh, these androgen compounds. Now the way that testosterone's production is going to be managed is very similar to what we saw in females with the production of estrogens and also uh, progestins. So similar to this, you're going to see that this kind of upper axis here uh, is going to be very similar and that the hypothalamus is going to be releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone. And that's going to be a positive influence on uh, the pituitary gland, which will be releasing luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Both of those are going to have positive effects, just as they did on the um, on the uterus and the endometrium. Uh, they're going to have positive effects on the testes here, and this is where we can see production of testosterone. Um, this is where we're also going to have uh, sperm production happening, and you also have production of this other um, compound called inhibin. And as you might imagine, uh, there's also going to be a negative feedback loop that's happening here, where when you have increasing concentrations of inhibin or increasing concentration of testosterone, they're going to feed back and start to shut down these um, pathways. So you have less gonadotropin releasing hormone being released, and you have less luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormone being released as well. This is also going to be important when we talk about um, things that are, you know, especially exogenous uh, testosterone and androgen compounds and how that will actually lead to things like um, decreased uh, spermatogenesis just due to the fact that these exogenous products are inhibiting um, release of uh, GnRH and uh, also LH and FSH. And by doing that, you kind of decrease the local concentration of uh, androgens in the testes. And that's where you're going to see a lot of that testicular atrophy and then also decreased sperm production come from. So we'll talk more about that in just a little bit, but just keep that um, this kind of feedback loop uh, in the back of your mind. So there's a couple different types of androgen products that we will talk about. These are the ones that have uh, essentially um, uh, products out in the market currently. Um, we'll see that testosterone itself, uh, that you know, the one that humans naturally produce, is going to be probably the most predominant product that you may see prescribed for patients. Um, so certainly things like uh, Androgel, Depoandro, Depotestosterone, lots of different varieties of it are going to be available. Most of the time you're going to see that these will either be injectable products or they're going to be transdermal products. Um, so like the Androgel is a product that, it's a gel product that you uh, apply directly to the testes. 
Um, depo Andro would be something uh, like an injectable product that would provide kind of long lasting kind of depo effects, kind of similar to what we saw with like depo medrol. And then uh, you will also have DHT or dihydrotestosterone being utilized as well. And again, this is the more potent component that is um, what is produced when 5-alpha reductase works on testosterone. There's also going to be some synthetic androgens that will be available as well. Um, these are usually either esters or they're alkylated forms of uh, naturally occurring uh, androgens. And so some of the big ones you'll see here are going to be either methyltestosterone, fluoxymesterone, and oxyandrolone. Uh, and you'll notice here these are going to be um, uh, the different brand names available. Notice uh, that some of these are going to have uh, IV products as well, but these have um, some of the benefits of having an oral formulation. I say benefits, but that's kind of with a caveat, and we'll talk about that in a little bit in, in, in regards to how the PO products are going to have effects on the liver. Notice here that because these are an, you know considered anabolic steroids, that these are all going to be controlled substances. So as opposed to your estrogen products or progestins, which are not considered to be anabolic steroids, they are not controlled. So you don't have to have necessarily have a DEA license and things like that to prescribe them, but these agents you absolutely must have the um, ability to prescribe controlled substances in order to, to prescribe these. So looking at the physiologic actions of testosterone um, and androgens, we'll see that via the estrogen, or the, I'm sorry, via the androgen receptor mediated effects, you're going to see things like development of the internal genitalia, you'll also see skeletal muscle being formed um, and developed, and also erythropoiesis, which will be important when we talk about some of the uses for our testosterone. And then we'll also see how DHT is going to be um, responsible for developing more of the external genitalia and also hair follicles. And so we'll see where this is important um, and can have big effects on uh, the growth of hair and whatnot in um, both males and females, especially if you know the females ha have issues where they're having kind of pronounced androgen type effects. And then once the androgens are converted over to estrogen compounds via aromatase, um, this is where they can also have some estrogen receptor mediated effects. So certainly uh, on the bone and bone development and, and uh, bone growth, and then also affecting things like libido. So some of the therapeutic uses of androgens, we also have some uh, anti-androgen products that are available as well, and we'll talk about some of the uses for those in a second, but mainly androgens you'll see being utilized for male infertility, so both you can use testosterone and methyl testosterone for this one. Um, you'll see that, uh, especially when the male is not producing enough of their own testosterone, this is uh, can be a decent way to help kind of uh, supplement that. Certainly if you have patients who have had um, their testicles removed, either related to um, cancer and things like that, you can also kind of use this as um, use this kind of hormone replacement therapy, although it can be somewhat controversial uh, in, uh, depending on who you talk to. Uh, androgens themselves are going to have positive effects on the bone, so they can be used to help treat osteoporosis. Um, in some cases they can be utilized as hormone replacement therapy as well when combined with an, uh, estrogens. Uh, this one you'll mainly see methyl testosterone being utilized. Um, and then in uh, some cases, you might actually see uh, fluoxymesterone being utilized for inoperable breast cancer. This isn't very often, but uh, more of an old school um, practice. But essentially, um, by giving this kind of excess androgen effects, um, you kind of limited um, the amount of testosterone that was being converted over to estrogens that would exacerbate the, uh, the breast cancer uh, tissue. And then also you can utilize the androgenic kind of uh, the anabolic functions of the drugs um, in order to help kind of wasting conditions. Um, so oxandrolone would be a big one you'd see here. But certainly if you have patients who are having significant weight loss due to things like trauma or AIDS or COPD, other things like that, any, anything where you'd need to kind of help um, boost uh, the body's ability to kind of grow itself back, um, uh, anabolic steroids uh, and androgens can be useful for this. And then looking at agents that are going to be blocking the effects of androgen at the receptors, um, these can be useful for things like metastatic prostate cancer. Usually you'll see with things like prostate cancer, you can utilize more kind of local treatment, either surgery or radiation. Um, but certainly if you have more disseminated disease, you're going to want to treat more systemically. And this is where systemically administered anti-androgens uh, can be useful. In addition to that, you can also um, utilize anti-androgens as a treatment for hirsutism in women, uh, especially those who are having um, uh, kind of more over-exaggerated androgen effects um, occurring. So as we kind of mentioned, uh, there's multiple formulations of androgens that are available, um, oral being um, 
not super useful in a lot of cases since testosterone itself is actually metabolized pretty readily within the liver. So it's not super good for uh, oral administration because of that. Um, on the other hand, you can utilize things like your 17 alkylated testosterones and your methyl testosterones. Since those don't get degraded as readily, um, they can be a, have a higher fraction, higher bio, bioavailability uh, of uh, drug being absorbed. Usually, when you're utilizing testosterone itself, it's either going to be administered as a transdermal product, either as a patch or a gel, um, or as an injection, where it can be utilized in these um, kind of ester-based uh, formats and in, in oils. And by doing that, it's able to provide kind of a long-lasting depot effect, where patients may only need to be um, injected every few weeks or months um, in order to have a full effect of the testosterone. Looking at our products, which will be anti-androgens, uh, we have drugs such as full androgen receptor antagonist. This will include flutamide and bicalutamide. Uh, these are useful for things like really kind of progressive metastatic um, prostate cancer, anything where you need to kind of limit the amount of androgen activity that's going on. Uh, you can certainly have drugs that have mixed androgen receptor and mineralocorticoid antagonist uh, actions. Um, so the big one here being spironolactone and, and to a much lesser degree a pluralinone. Um, but spir spironolactone is going to be one of your big ones here. As you remember, one of the big side effects you can see of spironolactone in men is going to be gynecomastia. And so that's basically related to the fact that you're antagonizing those androgen receptors and kind of getting more estrogen effects um, than you may uh, want in your male population. Um, you also have a mixed um, progestin receptor agonist, androgen receptor antagonist, which would be uh, ciproterone acetate. And then um, some of the other ones, which will, these drugs will actually talk a lot about more during the urology section, but you'll have your 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And so they basically would block the conversion of testosterone to the more potent DHT or dihydrotestosterone. Um, so these are mainly going to be seen in use for things like BPH, uh, bestein, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So uh, finasteride is going to be a big example of this, uh, proscar, and then dutasteride would be another uh, example of that. So looking at the side effects of androgens, there are numerous ones. Um, one of the big things you worry about, especially with uh, male patients, are, is going to be prostatic enlargement, which can lead to the aforementioned of BPH, and then also you run the risk of overstimulating the prostate to eventually lead it to develop cancer. Um, Another thing you'll see with overandrogen activity is going to be activation of that feedback loop where you have less gonadotropin releasing hormone being released and less um, luteinizing hormone and less uh, follicle stimulating hormone being released. And so by doing that, you kind of decrease a lot of the androgen production directly in the testes. And so usually that's kind of where the most concentrated um, uh, levels of testosterone are. And so by decreasing that, by leaving it to be more systemic and not having um, you know the kind of... Uh, hypothalamic access uh, causing production. That's where you can see atrophy there uh, and also azoospermia uh, develop as well, which can lead to infertility. Um, in some cases, uh, you can develop some degree of acne and gynecomastia related to um, some of these androgen activities. Um, and then especially some of those wasting conditions, you can see erythrocytosis develop. Um, doesn't happen very often, but certainly in conditions where they may be already um, anemic, this may be a, a positive effect for them. Now, related to the uh, mineralocorticoid effects, you can see with a lot of these androgens, um, you will see increased sodium in water retention. And so that could be potentially bad for patients, um, especially if they have any kind of issues with, you know, accumulating fluids or edema. So certainly patients with like CHF would be a big one. You'd be concerned about uh, exacerbating their edema type symptoms. Um, and then the other big thing we see with our 17 alkylated androgens, um, mainly because these are going to be oral products, um, they have some pretty significant hepatic side effects. So certainly cholestasis is possible, um, reduced HDL concentrations, which you know men are already more at risk for developing anyway, and then also um, possibly hepatitis. Um, so again, this can be, you can see potentially these with um, any of the 17 alkylated androgens, um, but more so when you have orally administered ones. And then um, the other big thing you'll see, especially in females taking um, androgens, is masculinization. So you can certainly see you know, increased muscle size, uh, deepening of the, of the voice, you know, hair growth um, where they might not want it. Um, so those effects, you know, an anecdotally have been um, 
reported to not be uh, reversible as, as much as they are in, in males. So just um, something that's been reported, I've seen especially in um, some of like the sports literature and things like that with, with females that have been you know, experimenting with um, androgen therapy. Um, as we mentioned, um, hormonal therapies can be utilized to treat things like benign prostatic hypertrophy. Um, and so, again, DHD inhibitors we'll talk much more about when we get to the urology section a little bit later in the class. Um, but essentially what they're going to be doing is having this competitive inhibition of 5-alpha reductase. And so by doing that, you prevent that conversion from testosterone to the more potent version of DHT. And as such, you're going to have um, you know, less androgen activity overall. So again, uh, finasteride and tetasteride would be your two big agents in this category. And then you have your uh, GNRH, or gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs. Um, again, these are agents that are typically going to be either given subcutaneously or intramuscularly. And what these are going to do is help to lower testosterone production by kind of helping to activate that feedback loop and decreasing the amount of GNRH that's going to be released um, from the hypothalamus over to the pituitary gland. And so the two ones you're going to see here include um, gazarelin and luprolide. So just to give you guys an idea of where these different kind of um, mixed androgen agonists versus antagonists are going to be working, um, again here you have the hypothalamus which will end up releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone. Um, here you're going to be seeing that the GnRH antagonists obviously will have some effects here. We didn't talk about these too much, but the GnRH agonists, especially for patients who already are having too much release here, um, you'll end up seeing a negative feedback uh, where you'll end up having less pituitary um, activation here. Um, you know, once this luteinizing hormone has been released onto the testes, uh, we can have uh, the testosterone that's being produced here being antagonized by things like spironolactone. Um, obviously, your 5-alpha reductase inhibitors are going to be useful here to prevent conversion over to dihydrotestosterone. Um, and then here, we will have androgen receptor antagonists being um, directly effective um, by blocking the effects of either testosterone or DHT from working within the, um, within the nucleus itself. Um, moving on, we'll have adrenocortical insufficiency we'll talk about. So we talked about uh, corticosteroids uh, pretty frequently in the past, and so we know that they're going to be affecting gene transcription by binding to the receptors of the nucleus. Uh, you'll see these either working directly on the glucocorticoid receptors or on the mineralocorticoid receptors. Again, this is um, kind of the prototype being aldosterone uh, for activating the mineralocorticoid receptor. And we know that these are going to be important for maintaining water balance and blood pressure. Um, oftentimes, while you'll see, especially patients in, say, refractory shock, end up being administered um, steroids that have high mineralocorticoid effects uh, to help kind of retain that water balance within the vasculature, maintain their blood pressure. Um, this is also useful for reabsorption of sodium from the distal convoluted tubules, so you'll have more kind of sodium in the bloodstream, thus drawing in more water. Um, the main corticosteroid, uh, or one of the main corticosteroids we'll see being released in the body is going to be cortisol. Uh, another name would be hydrocortisone, as we know uh, by the, uh, the drug name. Uh, typically, you'll see anywhere between 10 to 20 milligrams being secreted daily um, in a normal healthy patient. Obviously, uh, levels are going to ebb and flow uh, via its circadian rhythm, uh, but certainly when you have periods of stress, you're going to be seeing increased release of uh, cortisol. Um, so again, you can see issues with blood pressure, you can see issues with uh, blood glucose being changed, um, all related to, to um, stress, especially um, when you have increased cortisol concentrations. Now, a case where you'd have significant insufficiency of uh, cortisol release would be um, something like a chronic condition like Addison's disease. Um, this is kind of hallmarked by weakness, fatigue, weight loss, and, and hypotension. And they also have kind of a hard time maintaining their blood glucose. Again, we know that corticosteroids are going to have um, effects to raise blood glucose. Usually you see hyperglycemia as a, as a common side effect. Um, with these patients, they can be very severely adrenally insufficient, and so even um, minor events can cause pretty uh, dramatic uh, effects on their adrenal function, which can lead to things like circulatory shock and eventual death. So for these patients, they're oftentimes going to be given hydrocortisone daily in doses that try to mimic the normal amount that they would produce um, anyway. 
Uh, and again, during increased times of stress, they should be getting extra hydrocortisone to kind of help stimulate what their body would normally be producing in, in excess. Um, you also want to be uh, using uh, hydrocortisone in these patients along with a more salt-retaining hormone like fludrocortisone. You know, fludrocortisone is going to be much more heavy on the mineralocorticoid effects, so it's going to have a lot more um, potent effect to draw water into the circulatory system and help maintain that blood pressure. Um, and then we see that long-acting, more non-salt-retaining um, steroids should be generally avoided because, again, they can lead to kind of increased side effects without really getting to um, the mineral corticoid effects you're really looking for with these um, two steroids. Um, one of the next big things we'll talk about is going to be calcium homeostasis. So calcium homeostasis can be... Um, fairly confusing in a, in a lot of ways. There's a lot of um, kind of feedback loops happening, a lot of, a lot of important players. Um, but one of the big things we uh, can focus in on is that there's three main variables to maintaining calcium levels. Um, there's going to be the intake, going to be excretion from the kidneys specifically, and then also exchange with the reservoir, which is going to be our bones uh, for the most part. Now, normally you'll see that a normal plasma level of calcium will be anywhere between 8.8 .8 to 10.4 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and this is important because we want to maintain it in the, these normal values because when you get to kind of these more critical ranges where you have issues um, if your calcium levels are too low, so less than 6, point, uh, 6 milligrams per deciliter, um, this is where you can see um, uh, kind of increased excitation of the cells and increased depolarization so you can run into issues with tetany the muscles firing too much spontaneous contractions uh, and also seizures uh, can develop on the flip side when you have too much calcium around um, this is where you can see hyperpolarization of those cells so you actually have decreased firing rates of, of the different cells and neurons so you'll have lethargy and weakness being kind of one of the hallmarks of hypercalcemia um, So looking at calcium phosphate homeostasis, um, we'll see the three main things we talked about, which was going to be uh, the intake of calcium, uh, the interaction with the reservoir for calcium or the bone, and then also uh, excretion of calcium within the kidneys. So we'll see that there's a couple different hormones that are going to be really important in, in dealing with this. And, and one thing to note also is that calcium and phosphate are going to be really important for this process. Um, phosphate is going to be talked a little bit more about when we get to renal disease, especially chronic kidney disease. But essentially, what we see happen is normally um, calcium and phosphate will kind of come into the, uh, the GI tract through your normal dietary intake. Some will be excreted in the feces, um, but a decent proportion of it is going to be um, uptaken into the serum. And this is going to be regulated a lot by vitamin D. This is going to have a positive effect on increasing serum concentrations of both calcium and phosphate. You'll see after this, when we get to the excretion um, component of it, we'll see that several different hormones are going to be important for maintaining um, both the release of calcium and phosphate. And when we have things like chronic kidney disease, we'll see that all of this go out of whack and we can run into some big issues with calcium and phosphate homeostasis. Essentially what we see though is that we'll have uh, vitamin D being a negative or inhibitory factor on loss of calcium. You'll we'll see that parathyroid hormone or PTH will also have a negative effect. We'll have another um, hormone called calcitonin will have a positive effect. So calcitonin is useful for getting rid of extra calcium. On the flip side when you have um, a phosphate we're talking about you'll see that vitamin D has a negative effect on here so vitamin D will actually have, cause you to retain more phosphate. Uh, parathyroid hormone will actually do the opposite and will actually increase the elimination of phosphate. Calcitonin will do the same thing. And then you also have this other component, uh, a fibroblast uh, growth factor 23, which also have um, positive effects to eliminate more phosphate. And then looking on the, the exchange reservoir, um, we can see that um, both vitamin D and PTH, or parathyroid hormone, are going to be useful for both stimulating bone resorption and also the laying down of new bone. So it helps to stimulate both osteoclasts and osteoblasts. And this is important to have new uh, mineralization and turnover of bone, um, which is uh, you know healthy in, in normal individuals uh, to occur. And we will see here where calcitonin will actually have a negative effect on this and actually decrease the amount of mobilization and relaying of the bone uh, occur. 
So first off, we'll talk about the calciferols. Uh, this is basically just the uh, broad name for vitamin D in the different metabolites. Uh, major therapeutic uses we'll see is for the prophylaxis and cure of nutritional rickets. So this is issues where you have kind of uh, weak bones um, that are brought about by insufficient calcium intake within the diet. You also have issues of chronic uh, management of metabolic rickets and osteomalacia. And the difference between nutritional and metabolic rickets is that with metabolic rickets, it's more of an issue, uh, especially in chronic uh, renal failure patients, where they actually um, will end up holding on to too much phosphate and calcium. And one thing you'll note is that when you mix calcium and phosphate together, you'll actually have them precipitate out. Um, and so this can actually decrease levels of both components within the blood. We can also see that vitamin D will be useful for um, patients who have hypoparathyroidism and subsequent hypocalcemia because this will help to draw in more calcium into, um, into the GI, from the GI tract into systemic circulation and also prevent an elimination uh, within the kidneys. And then um, also useful for the prevention and treatment of osteoporosis, again by increasing amounts of calcium that's available in the bloodstream to, to lay down to the bone. As far as individual preparations go, there are numerous ones out there, and they're basically all kind of, um, are different varieties of vitamin D at different activation points within the body. Um, we'll see the, so the two big ones you're going to see most often are going to be cholecalciferol, or vitamin D3, and then ergocalciferol, vitamin D2. Um, ergocalciferol, both of these products are going to be oral, um, but you will see that they're also going to be contraindicated in either liver or kidney disease. And the reason for this is, and I'll show you some pictures in a second that illustrate this, is that these vitamin D products cannot be activated uh, without healthy livers or kidneys being present um, to help convert them over to the active forms. Normally when you're taking these formulations, they're inactive and aren't really any better than taking placebo, unless you can activate them yourself. So looking at the different um, ways that we can have vitamin D um, being produced uh, within the body, um, you can see here that we'll have, uh, you know, probably have no problem developing vitamin D through yourself since we all live in Florida. It's nice and sunny, so lots of UV rays to help kind of uh, stimulate this conversion over to produce vitamin D3, um, which will uh, deposit itself directly in the plasma. Um, you'll also have vitamin D2 and D3 being uh, absorbed from the diet. Uh, just natural thing you're going to be um, getting from certain vitamin D rich foods or you know multivitamins and things like that. Now normally what's going to happen is once uh, D2 or D3 gets into the liver it's going to be converted over to this 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Now this is all well and good but it's still not the active form. Um, now part of it can be converted over to this 24-25 hydroxy vitamin D. This isn't really that useful. It doesn't really do a whole lot for you. Where the real activity comes from is when uh, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D goes into the kidneys, where it can be processed by the renal mitochondria to produce 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And so this is going to be the useful formulation that's going to be available to help um, with bone resorption, help with increased calcium um, absorption in the intestine, and also uh, have um, inhibitory effects on, on the parathyroid hormone, the kidney, and, and also striated muscle. Again, looking at um, kind of a picture we've seen uh, previously, but normally you'll have 125 dihydroxy vitamin D have positive effects on absorbing calcium from the gut. And so it's going to lead to increased levels of calcium within the blood. And this is also going to help to stimulate the laying down of new bone within the muscle, uh, within the uh, new calcium into the bone. Um, and also it's going to help to resorb that as well. And so you have a nice good bone turnover um, that's you know, useful for healthy bone structure. Um, Within the thyroid gland, you're also going to have your parathyroid hormone, which are going to be, uh, or your parathyroid hormone is produced from your parathyroids, and this is um, going to be inhibited by 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Normally, what you'll see is that parathyroid hormone is going to have positive effects on releasing calcium from the bone because this is typically going to be released when uh, the body thinks there's not enough calcium around. So parathyroid hormone is going to be useful in helping to relieve or release some of that calcium from the bone into circulation. Normally you'll see that 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is going to be inhibitory on this uh, factor. 
We'll also see calcitonin is going to be useful to help eliminate or decrease the amount of bone resorption happening. Um, so normally calcitonin is being utilized when you have uh, too high a vitamin or too high a calcium levels. Um, so we'll see that come up just a little bit later with some of our pro uh, with the, some of our formulations. And then um, finally looking over here, you'll see that 125-dihydroxy um, vitamin D is also going to be uh, stimulated. It's going to help um, raise calcium levels in the presence of parathyroid hormones. So this will be a positive effect on here. And then we talked about that fibroblast uh, growth factor 23 having an inhibitory effect on this uh, process, this conversion from 25 to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. here um, looking at bone resorption and also um, uh, bone stimulation we'll see the parathyroid hormone and 125 dihydroxy vitamin D have both positive effects on both sides of things um, again because it's going to be leading to a, a good bone turnover um, as far as osteoclast function goes and leading to destruction or resorption of the bone um, we'll see the things like our calcitonin or estrogens and also our bisphosphonates which we haven't really talked about before are going to be useful to inhibit this process to help retain as much bone as possible So looking at the uh, more active forms of vitamin D, uh, the products that we have, we'll have, we'll have uh, calci uh, calcifidiol, which is the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And again, this is the form normally is going to be produced in the liver, but it still is just a precursor. It must be uh, metabolized um, within the kidneys in order to produce the active form. Um, so as you might imagine, this drug would be contraindicated in kidney disease because, again, if you give it to a patient with bad kidneys, they're not going to produce any of uh, the active form. Um, also, you could actually measure levels of uh, this form of vitamin D to actually get a, an indicator of the, a patient's total vitamin D status, since all the vitamin D2 and D3 that they're producing or ingesting um, should be going through this process to form the, the 120, uh, should uh, at least be producing the 25-hydroxy uh, D3. And then um, you'll have calcitriol, uh, which is the completely active form. You can give this to patients with bad kidneys, with bad livers. Um, doesn't really matter because it's already active. Um, so this is typically going to be the most fast-acting uh, form of vitamin D. Uh, it's going to be oral and injectably available. Um, and again, it's more expensive because it's already activated form, but it is uh, most useful in, in renal failure. Um, I will tell you that I probably see for renal patients, especially I see calcitriol being used most often. Um, I haven't really seen a whole lot of calcifidiol being utilized out in, in clinical practice. So looking at the actual mechanism of how the calciferols work, um, vitamin D is going to be binding to these cytosolic receptors. And what happens is complex will enter the nucleus um, and it will help to stimulate protein synthesis. And so in the GI tract, it's going to be leading to increased levels of different proteins like this um, um, intramembrane calcium binding hormone, um, calbindin, uh, calcium ATPA. So it'll all be um, stimulated in the presence of vitamin D. Um, like we mentioned that glucocorticoids actually have negative effects on um, retention of bone and can actually lead to osteoporosis. You'll see that this actual function is, uh, the positive functions of vitamin D are going to be inhibited by these glucocorticoids. So it has a, a kind of a direct antagonistic uh, relationship. Also see uh, that vitamin D is going to be working within the, the nucleus to help stimulate bone resorption by the osteoclast. Um, and it will also decrease the collagen synthesis by the osteoblast, which is going to help for that mineralization of new bone. Um, we'll also see increases in the uptake of calcium by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, especially on skeletal muscle, and then also decreases in parathyroid hormone levels. Another form of synthetic vitamin D that we have is going to be uh, paracalcitol or Zemplar. Again, this is a, uh, an analog of vitamin D, and what this is actually going to do is activate the vitamin D receptors in, in multiple different organs. Um, one of the big things we'll see it um, being utilized for is its inhibition of parathyroid hormone. So by activating the vitamin D receptors on the parathyroids, you'll see decreased levels of PTH. You also end up seeing increased renal elimination of calcium and decreased bone resorption. 
So if you had a patient who, say, was having uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism associated with something like chronic kidney disease, uh, and they're having hypercalcemia, you can actually give this vi uh, version of vitamin D, which itself is not really useful to increase um, levels of calcium, but can decrease your PTH levels and lead to more elimination of calcium. So here it's kind of working as um, kind of a false vitamin D and um, kind of causing the opposite effects of what you would expect. And adverse effects, uh, mainly going to be things like nausea and some increased risk for infection. Um, for what reason, I'm not quite sure, um, but certainly in kidney patients, um, uh, you're already going to have increased risk for infection anyway. So this could be one of those things is could be more of an association uh, than anything else. Looking at the actual amount of calcium that should be intake. Um, are taken in by patients uh, can range um, somewhat widely. Um, obviously, your patients are going to be more, uh, they're going to be more elderly, uh, they're going to be more at risk for osteoporosis and osteopenia, um, should definitely be getting higher um, calcium levels in. Um, keep in mind, though, that uh, this can be detrimental, especially in your elderly patients who may be suffering from things like constipation. Um, so, uh, calcium can certainly make that worse. Um, but the big thing to remember here is that if you're going to be given vitamin D, you definitely want to be given calcium with it. Um, otherwise, you, you know, especially if a patient doesn't have enough good calcium intake in their diet, you can give them vitamin D all day long, and they really won't absorb very much of it um, regardless. Another product that we have is going to be calcitonin. Um, normally, this is going to be produced in the parafollicular cells uh, within the uh, within the thyroid gland and the parathyroid. Um, typically, what this is going to be used for is to help lower calcium and phosphate levels in hypercalcemia, and also help to decrease bone resorption. So, basically, trying to keep more bone, uh, more calcium in the bone, um, in order to help maintain um, healthy, strong bones when you can. Um, and so. The big place you're going to see this being used uh, pretty frequently is going to be in chronic kidney disease. Again, we'll talk more about this when we get to kind of the renal lectures, but uh, just keep in mind that the calcitonin is really important for this uh, point here. And kind of a minor point, it's going to help uh, in the kidneys is going to be decreasing renal uh, reabsorption of phosphate and calcium. Um, so again, just to kind of show you another example of the feedback loop that's occurring um, between things like uh, calcium and, and parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Um, uh, starting out, say we have low calcium levels here. Um, again, these uh, kind of lightning bolt looking lines are going to be stimulation. These are going to be an inhibition. Um, but essentially what's happening is when you have lower levels of calcium, that's going to be stimulating bone resorption by stimulating parathyroid hormone. Um, it's going to be releasing that PTH. And vitamin D is going to be useful for this as well in order to help um, increase bone resorption, so increasing calcium levels from that. It's going to lead to more reabsorption of calcium within the kidneys and also more absorption of uh, calcium from the intestines. Again, that's going to help lead to increased calcium levels. Normally, increased calcium levels are going to feed back and inhibit PTH release. It will also help to stimulate the release of calcitonin from these parafollicular cells. When that happens, you're going to see less resorption from the bone and maybe a little bit less uh, reabsorption from the kidneys, which can ultimately, if you had too much activity, lead to low calcium levels. So you can see how it kind of has a kind of cyclical nature to it and all is very, uh, it's a kind of a delicate balance. And, and when you have patients who have things like chronic kidney disease, this can get very much out of whack um, and you can get very significant things like um, uh, hyperparathyroidism and, and things like that. So um, calcitonin, you'll typically see uh, the treat is used to treat things like osteoporosis. It's used to treat things like metastatic hypercalcemia, and can also be utilized to treat um, the, some of the pain and issues along with, with uh, Paget's disease. Um, we know Paget's disease is going to be this acceleration of osteoclast activity, coupled with this increased uh, and disorganized bone formation that that occurs. It's kind of a painful condition in a lot of ways. Um, one of the things that we'll see as a contraindication to um, uh, calcitonin, uh, especially formulations that are produced from salmon, um, kind of similar to what we saw with protamine uh, in the last lecture, um, certain calcitonin preparations are made from salmon. So if you had a fish hypersensitivity, this could be a problem here. Um, and giving calcitonin will also be recommended to avoid in patients who are pregnant or breastfeeding, because again, you typically don't want to cause hypocalcemia uh, in a patient who's trying to develop uh, you know, a brand new skeleton.
couple of preparations um, that we have uh, of calcitonin are going to be uh, both myocalcin and fortical. Um, this used to actually be derived from cadavers, which uh, fortunately we don't have to um, do that nowadays. Um, but for a while we're using salmon-based products um, to get calcitonin. Um, but nowadays you'll actually end up seeing more recombinant products being made. Um, you know, the synthetic um, certainly more potent than your kind of natural formulations. Um, so uh, typically it can be given either sub-Q, uh, IM, or in some cases even nasally. You can absorb it uh, as kind of a, a nasal spray. Um, now, due to whatever reason, maybe it has to do with the bone resorption effects, but it, it will provide analgesic effect to patients with Paget's disease. And so the nasal administration is really recommended for that uh, because even though it has reduced bioavailability, it has much um, kind of faster onset to action and more rapid analgesic relief here. Um, Obviously, you can see issues um, with uh, the nasal spray causing things like rhinitis and nosebleed. Not quite sure why it causes back pain, uh, but headache could be uh, somewhat common as well, uh, adverse side effect with, with calcitonin. Uh, moving on, other drugs are going to help prevent bone resorption are going to be the bisphosphonates. Um, typically, the big therapeutic uses you're going to see here are going to be um, for issues where you're having increased bone resorption, so certainly Paget's disease, certainly anything where you're having a, say, a metastatic hypercalcemia related to um, you know, certain cancers can release parathyroid parathyroid hormone-like products, and so this can mimic uh, PTH and cause hypercalcemia. And then also they can be utilized to help um, increase um, spinal bone mass in patients with uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis. And obviously contraindications would include hypocalcemia, because um, again, this can just exacerbate it if you're not able to resorb more uh, calcium from the bone. And then one of the big things you'll see with the oral products specifically is they have a tendency to really get stuck in uh, the esophagus. And if left there, they can cause damage and erosion and potentially perforation in some rare cases. So it's really important that patients, uh, if they're not able to sit up and not able to take, uh, you know, stay sitting for, for 30 minutes or so, um, they're probably not going to be good candidates for these bisphosphonates. Um, so again, bedridden individuals or those with esophageal abnormalities, not really going to be um, useful for the oral formulations. And then um, renal insufficiency could be another kind of um, relative contraindication um, to use as well. And one of the first uh, generation bisphosphonate products we had was sodium metidronate. Uh, it was a synthetic analog of pyrophosphate. And typically it's going to be reserved either for patients with moderate severe Paget's disease or if you had certain neoplasms that were releasing those parathyroid uh, hormone-like products causing significant hypercalcemia. Uh, and some patients who were maybe more asymptomatic, if they were having extensive bone damage, um, they could be utilizing this as well. Now, uh, there's oral and parental formulations available, um, but and this is pretty common with all the bisphosphonates, it's very, very poor oral bioavailability. Maybe only one to 2% of the dose that you uh, uh, ingest is gonna actually be absorbed. These products, even though they may not have, a, you know, the actual half-life may not be super long, um, their relative duration of action is gonna be very, very long because they like to concentrate within the bone. So you'll see some of these products are actually only have to be given once every few months, uh, maybe once a week. Um, some are even given once a year. Um, because of this, you're gonna see reduced peripheral toxicity because it's gonna be just kind of concentrated in the bone and it's also very resistant to metabolism. So it's gonna be sticking around for quite some time. Uh, one of the first uh, second generation bisphosphonates that we had was going to be alendronate or Fosamax. And so this one was actually useful because not only did it work to decrease calcium levels, um, but it was actually shown in studies to actually strengthen the bone rather than just preventing bone loss from occurring. Um, and so uh, it was also uh, recommended for postmenopausal osteoporosis, probably where it got its most use, and also in Paget's disease where it can help to do things like alleviate bone pain and whatnot. Um, again, Bioavailability is very low, so it's important to take this on an empty stomach. Uh, they are to take it with food, uh, gets you know, or other medications. Uh, it's very possible to have um, uh, food drug interactions or drug drug interactions where the drug does not really get that absorbed. So it needs to be taken by itself. It should be separated out from other meds for several hours. Um, usually they say either take this, um, you know, two hours before other meds or four hours after. Uh, no food on the stomach and they need to really remain upright for 30 minutes. So because of that, you can kind of be rough on the stomach, um, which can be um, one of the problems for your patients and may preclude them from getting oral and they have to use more of an IV product. 
Um, there's pomidronate, which is another second generation agent that is parenteral only. Again, this one's going to be useful in rapidly concentra uh, concentrating the bone um, and is typically reserved for more refractory cases of pagets. Uh, if you have significant hypercalcemia related to neoplasms or if you have um, hyperparathyroidism resulting in moderate severe bone pain. Um, certainly, I'll see this in a lot of chronic kidney patients um, to help manage their secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, one of the other drawbacks is it's going to be pretty expensive. Uh, there's also uh, zoledronic acid or uh, zolindronate. Uh, Reclass is a brand name. Um, this one has such a long half-life, it's only actually infused once a year IV. And then there's abandronate or boniva. This is going to be a third generation bisphosphonate. Uh, this one is also has some positive data to support it, reducing vertebral fractures due to osteoporosis and is um, pretty much first line agent uh, for this nowadays. Um, also can be utilized for malignant hypercalcemia in pagets. Uh, and this one uh, you know, is either taken, um, I believe, once weekly orally or can be given um, uh, via injection once every three months. So it can be pretty good for patient um, patient adherence if they're able to only get an injection every three months versus having to take something every day. So another way we can help to um, strengthen the bone would be to apply fluoride. Um, so you know that uh, fluoride has lots of therapeutic uses, um, mainly used to treat uh, osteoporosis and also neoplastic bone disease. Um, and over time, it's uh, been shown to increase vertebral bone mass by about 10% per, uh, per year. Um, and at therapeutic doses, it's actually been shown to increase the number of osteoblasts are available to help kind of lay down new bone. Now, it does this by substituting, uh, instead of laying down hydroxyapatite, it's actually going to be laying down fluoroapatite and fluorohydroxyapatite. And so some people feel that... Um, you know, you may be retaining more bone mass, but it's more brittle. It's not nearly as strong as the hydroxyapatite normally is. Um, um, but even so, low doses, um, you know, 20 to 90 milligrams per day have been shown to stimulate new bone formation. Um, but it's really, really important to remember that you always want to combine it with calcium, vitamin D, and especially if it's for um, osteoporosis, uh, estrogen as well, because again, it's all going to have positive effects on the bone. You're all going to make sure that you're having enough um, supply um, in the form of calcium and also with the vitamin D help the, be able to process it appropriately. And even if you didn't have enough calcium to lay down in the bone, this can actually cause osteomalacia um, by having um, just kind of a more uh, fluoride being laid down than actual calcium in that, in that case. Other things we can do to help um, uh, positive effects on the bone are going to include raloxifen or Avista, as we've mentioned before uh, in our hormone, uh, female hormone lecture. Um, this is a selective estrogen receptor modulator or SERM. Um, and this one, because it has positive estrogen effects within the bone, has been FDA approved for the prevention of osteoporosis. Um, produces mostly modest increases in bone density, um, but the nice thing here, it's been shown to reduce risk of vertebral compression fractures, uh, which has been shown to be um, uh, certainly bad uh, in, in your elderly patients over time. So then looking at the parathyroid hormone, uh, normally in normal function, its release is going to be controlled by calcium levels. So it's going to be working uh, within the kidney to help raise uh, plasma calcium levels by increasing reabsorption of calcium and also by um, having positive effects on the production of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Um, in the bone, though, you're going to see that it's actually going to be increasing osteocytic osteolysis um, and increasing osteoclast bone resorption. So by doing this, um, it's going to help to uh, increase levels of, of calcium within the serum. Um, and kind of indirectly from the GI standpoint, by increasing um, production of active vitamin D, it's also going to help with the um, increase in calcium absorption from the intestines. So again, in summary, increasing plasma calcium levels. Now, normally, as we've stated, there's some conditions like chronic kidney disease where this can kind of go out of whack and become more um, active than it should. Um, certain uh, neoplasms especially can, can cause this kind of state as well. So one drug that we can use to, ha to help uh, inhibit parathyroid hormone secretion is going to be sinicalcid. And so this drug actually mimics the stimulatory effect of um, calcium. Um, so by doing that, your parathyroid hormone, um, your parathyroid basically thinks that there's enough calcium around. I don't need to be releasing any more hormone to increase calcium levels. 
It's also going to help to um, increase the sensitivity of those receptors as well. Um, so basically it's going to be approved for the treatment of hyperparathyroidism. Uh, um, and so by doing so, it's going to be helping to lower serum calcium, phosphate, and parathyroid hormone levels. Um, this is going to help sustain normalization of serum calcium levels uh, without really affecting much uh, bone mineral density. Um, now in some cases, if you have... Um, you know, the drug is being too effective and you don't have enough parathyroid hormone around, it may actually produce hypocalcemia uh, in some cases. Now, not only that, but it can also interact with drugs that regulate calcium homeostasis, leading to either hyper or hypocalcemia, depending on uh, what type of interaction you're talking about. All right, uh, moving on, the, one of the last sections we'll talk about is going to be thyroid pharmacology. Looking at the... Um, thyroid-related disorders. It's one of the most common endocrine diseases. Um, you know, it can affect anywhere between 4 and 5% of the U.S. population. Um, and it certainly is going to be more prevalent with age, uh, and certainly in some cases, hypo, uh, hypothyroidism may go unnoticed because the symptoms can be um, fairly mild or fairly, um, you know, um, kind of insidious in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so uh, thyroid disease can be manifested as either hyper or hyposecretion of thyroid hormone. Uh, looking at the types of endocrine disorders, uh, we can see issues of hyposecretion of thyroid hormone. Um, can either be primary, secondary, or tertiary in nature. Um, essentially, with primary hypothyroidism, you can see destruction of the gland or lack of precursor. Um, so we'll talk about that in relation to iodine and iodide being really important um, for production of thyroid hormone. Um, secondary uh, Hyposecretion is related to lack of, of tropic hormone, so essentially you have less thyroid stimulating hormone uh, available uh, to actually stimulate the thyroid hormone. And then uh, the tertiary would be a lack of the hypothalamic hormone, which would be this thyrotropin releasing uh, hormone, or um, TRH. Uh, essentially, it doesn't really matter what the actual cause is because the hyposecretion of uh, uh, thyroid hormone can be replaced by just more thyroid hormones. So we'll talk about the different drugs that can be utilized to replace that. Now the hypersecretion, again, it can be all related to either um, too much of the trophic hormone, too much of the hypothalamic hormone, or the gland is just secreting too much. Um, regardless, you'll see that the drugs we're going to be utilizing are going to be um, used to de basically decrease the production from, uh, from the actual gland itself uh, in order to um, prevent overproduction of, of thyroid hormone or to prevent the activation of the hormone, as we'll see in just a little bit. Looking at the, you know, uh, uh, kind of axes like these are, are pretty um, common as we've seen with, you know, things like um, production of androgens and estrogens. Um, but essentially what we're going to be seeing here is that the, the hypothalamus is going to be releasing um, a thyrotropin releasing hormone to the anterior pituitary gland, which is going to be releasing uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, which it will uh, directly stimulate the thyroid gland. Um, what you'll actually end up seeing is uh, these same, similar um, feedback loops here where uh, the hormones uh, T4 and T3 are going to be uh, negative inhibitors on, are going to be um, uh, causing inhibition of release of these uh, different hormones uh, to basically shut down um, uh, pr new production of thyroid hormone. Um, again, what you'll typically see when you're assessing thyroid function is not necessarily always measuring active levels of T4 or T3, but you'll typically be measuring levels of thyroid stimulating hormone. And if those are high, that's going to tell you that um, you, this inhibition, this feedback loop is not really being triggered because these levels are um, particularly low. And so that can be a good sign of um, decreased thyroid activity um, and need for replacement. Another thing to note here is that iodine, or iodide, whichever formulation it has to be in, um, can both inhibit and have uh, positive effects on the production of thyroid hormone. So in some cases, by having too little iodine, you can't produce new thyroid hormone. In some cases, having too much can actually overstimulate the gland and cause um, less production of thyroid hormone to, be, um, to, to occur. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So looking at agents to help replace thyroid hormone, again, this one's pretty easy because we're just giving basically the, um, the either the inactive or the active components in order to help replace what the thyroid hormone's not making itself. So the most common one is going to be levothyroxine. And what this basically is, is T4. We'll show you what those are in just a little bit. But basically T4 is going to be the inactive formulation of thyroid hormone. And this is going to be the drug of choice for hormone replacement therapy, uh, mainly because it has a very... Um, 
consistent potency and a very prolonged duration of action. So right around six to seven days or so. So this is nice because even if you have a patient with uh, compliance issues and they miss a few doses, they're not really going to see a big difference in effect uh, for these drugs over a period of time. Um, while GI absorption is generally pretty good, you will see that parental forms are also available. Um, in my uh, experience, I most often will end up seeing um, levothyroxine drips being utilized in trans life patients or patients who are um, clinically brain dead but are still able to um, donate their organs um, to other patients. And so I'll oftentimes see trans life come into the ICU or the surgical ICU um, and actually will start up a number of different drips, um, one of them being um, thyroid hormone. Um, so because when you have brain death, their patient's not really going to be producing much of their own hormone anymore since the axis has kind of been turned off at that point. Um, it's important to note that uh, a lot of different drugs can interact with the absorption of levothyroxine, so certainly things like calcium, iron, aluminum. So typically you want to uh, try to avoid, um, you know, by at least a few hours, um, taking your levothyroxine or, and any of these other agents. Um, you can also have issues with absorption, certainly uh, if you have intestinal flora alterations, uh, and then uh, induction of P450 enzymes may actually enhance excretion of the drug and prevent it from being all that useful. Um, also can be utilized uh, for suppressive therapy, potentially if you have a patient who had, say, uh, a tumor that was producing too much um, thyroid stimulating hormone, this can actually be utilized as kind of a, uh, to force that feedback loop and prevent for the production of the, that uh, hormone. Um, the other form you could potentially give is going to be T3, and so the big products here, um, this is normally called uh, liathyronine, and the big products you'll see here are things like Cytomel or Triostat, and so like I said, this one is the active formulation, so levothyroxine, when you give it, has to be biologically converted over to T3 by removing one of the iodines uh, from, uh, from the molecule. And so this one, again, is going to have oral and parenteral formulations, um, and typically this is going to be utilized when you need a quicker onset of action. Um, you know, T4 needing several days before you really start to see big effects versus T3, which is already active and can be working a little bit more immediately. Um, because of that, though, it's going to require typically more frequent dosing um, since the half-life is only around one day or so, and it's also going to be more expensive. And then you can have certain products which are going to be kind of mixtures of the two. So Liatrix is going to be a 4 to 1 ratio of T4 to T3, uh, brand name uh, being there, Thyrolar. Um, yeah, this one is considered to be a little bit more natural um, in that your body normally is producing a ratio of T4 to T3 of about 5 to 1. Um, again, clinically, I really see a lot of levothyroxine being used. Very uh, rarely do you see many of the other products being utilized. So, of course, um, the major therapeutic uses are going to be uh, cases of hypothyroidism, so certainly if you have Hashimoto's or myxedema, and then if you have patients who have either had a removal of the thyroid gland or if they've had actual radioiodine ablation. And so this is where you actually will use radio-labeled iodine to be taken up into the thyroid gland in order to emit um, radiation and actually kill off the, the gland itself. So again, the mechanism, free thyroid hormone is going to enter the target cells. Um, once it's there, T4 can be converted over T3. And T3 is the active form that's going to actually enter into the nucleus. There, it's going to help uh, to bind to specific T3 receptors um, that can exist in kind of either the alpha or the beta phase. Um, and so regardless of once it does that, it's going to be activating these nuclear receptors. And so we'll turn on formulation or formation of RNA and lead to subsequent protein synthesis. So again, all these uh, you know, endocrine um, hormones are going to have very similar uh, effects in that they're all going to go to the nucleus and be activating gene transcription um, from there. Now on the other side of that, if you want to inhibit the formation of uh, thyroid hormone, um, you are going to be giving products that fall into this thiouraline uh, or thioamide family. And so the two drugs you're going to see here used most often uh, are going to be propothiouracil or PTU and then also methimazole or tapazole. Um, notice that methimazole has uh, a little bit longer half-life uh, than PTU. Uh, and it's a lot more potent as well. So we'll say that uh, I typically see methimazole being utilized more often than uh, PTU. Um, complications uh, can include some blood dyscrasia, things like granulocytopenia and things like that, um, but for the most part are fairly well tolerated. So the mechanism of these antithyroid drugs is that they're going to be interfering with the oxidation of the iodide ion um, by inhibiting this peroxidase enzyme. And I'll show you guys a picture of this in a second. Um, but essentially what this does is prevent the organification of iodine. 
And so by doing that, it's preventing it from being um, added on to the thyroglobin of the molecule. Um, and the big thing here to note is that um, you have to have depletion of your already uh, formed um, thyroid hormone before this really started to have effects. So similar to what you saw with something like warfarin, we actually had to deplete uh, already active clotting factors before you saw the, the effect. These drugs are going to be very similar. You have to get rid of the T4 and T3 you've already had formed um, for this drug to prevent new production of thyroid hormone. So most often you'll end up seeing um, this being utilized for things like Graves' disease, which is an autoimmune disorder where you're actually having these um, antibodies that are stimulating thyroid, um, stimulating hormone receptors to produce new um, thyroid hormone. And then you can also utilize it for multinodular goiter. Um, you'll see that this can be useful for shrinking the gland um, before surgery. So I always thought this was kind of a cool picture um, where essentially you can see just how vascular um, the thyroid gland is. Um, very, very, uh, you know, well uh, supplied with blood. So if you can do anything to help shrink this down, it's going to make it a lot easier to remove. So this is where you'll see use of things like um, antithyroid uh, medications in order to help shrink this down to make the removal uh, a little bit easier for the surgeon. And again, just a picture of a nice big goiter uh, this patient can have. As you might imagine, that would be fairly difficult to remove. Uh, so anything you can do to help kind of shrink that down um, can be uh, somewhat useful. Um, so looking at non-toxic goiter, uh, typically outside of the U.S., it's going to be related to an iodide deficiency. So not something you see here all that too often in the U.S. And you really don't need a ton of iodide in order to help prevent this, maybe only around 50 milligrams per year. Uh, but certainly you can help to uh, alleviate uh, these goiters by giving the iodide. And that will help normal production of the thyroid hormone uh, and help to shrink that down quite a bit. So what's happening um, when you have these antithyroid drugs, and so kind of walk you through the whole process here. Um, essentially what we're seeing is that normally what you're going to have is the iodide being brought in to the cell. So again, this is within the, um, the thyroid hormone, or I'm sorry, within the thyroid gland, um, and this is the apical side, the basolateral side. And so once the iodide comes into the cell, it's going to be converted over to iodine by this peroxidase enzyme. And this is what's being inhibited by the thioamides like PTU and also methimazole. So by inhibiting this conversion over, you get less iodine being formed. Now normally, what's happening here is this organification process is combining iodine with tyrosine. So you either get this monoiodine tyrosine or diiodotyrosine. And so Obviously, one of them having one iodine molecule, one of them having two iodine molecules. And so all these three end up getting converted with thyroglobulin to either form T4 or T3. And then eventually this is going to be brought back into the cell where proteolysis occurs, where it's actually going to be removing the thyroglobulin, and then it can be released into the bloodstream where it can have this normal effect. Again, T3 being the already active form, T4 needing to be converted over to T3 before it can be useful. So um, some of the things we can do to help treat hyperthyroidism is certainly by um, doing radioactive iodine. And so what you can end up using, um, there's a couple of different formulations. You know, there's I-123, which is useful for um, thyroid scans. It has around, around a half-life around 13 hours or so. But there's also this 131 um, that's useful for releasing things like beta particles. And so, um, you know, your thyroid gland, if you, if you give iodine, this is typically going to be uptaken by uh, the thyroid gland. So it tends to concentrate there. And so by giving this, iodine, this uh, radioactive iodide, it can actually be taken up by the gland and it will sit there and basically emit the particles and help to kind of kill off that tissue. Um, certainly, as you might imagine, you're going to be seeing high incidence of delayed hypothyroidism as you kind of kill off this tissue. You can also um, utilize uh, high levels of iodides, uh, such as a saturated solution of potassium iodide, which is oftentimes um, uh, abbreviated as SSKI. You know, K being for the potassium, and then also Lugol solution is another uh, formulation of uh, saturated um, iodide. And so essentially uh, you can utilize this to treat hyperthyroidism. Um, usually not used as a sole therapy by itself, but the idea is um, by giving high levels of iodide, that can actually serve to limit the new production of T4 and T3. And so you'll end up usually seeing it initiate after the onset of thioamide therapy, and you can see symptoms happen uh, within two to seven days or so as you start to deplete some of the already circulating um, T4 and T3. Again, this is another way we can utilize um, these drugs to decrease the vascularity and size of the hyperplastic gland um, prior to removing it. Um, 
uh, complications associated with iodism or high levels of iodine include things like rash, uh, swollen salivary glands, and fever, and also ulcerations of the mucous membranes. Um, and another use for iodides could also be prophylactically when you're at risk for radiation exposure. Again, um, the one of the good ways in order to help prevent um, uptake of radioactive uh, iodide is by providing yourself with non-radioactive iodide. So um, by kind of giving higher doses of the iodide, you prevent uptake of new iodide. And so by doing that, um, you prevent uptake of this kind of radioactive um, uh, iodide and can basically just eliminate it without being absorbed. So kind of going back to that diagram I showed you earlier, essentially uh, the process of producing um, new thyroid hormone is by uh, first you have this iodide trapping where essentially you're having the uptake of the iodide into the follicular cells of the thyroid uh, gland. And then once they are there, you'll end up seeing them being oxidized over to iodine. Again, since that uh, thyroidal peroxidase is going to be either blocked by high levels of iodide or can be blocked by the thioamides. Once it's there, it undergoes the organification process where it's going to be combined with tyrosine and can form either the monoiodotyrosine or the diiodotyrosine. Um, and then once uh, those uh, are combined with thyroglobulin, you're going to be seeing um, uh, the formation of T4 and T3. So again, uh, when two molecules of DIT combine with thyroglobulin, that's when you end up having T4. And then when mo one molecule of MIT and one molecule of DIT uh, forms, you're going to get T3. Um, those products then can be stored in the colloid. They can kind of stick around there for a little while. And as I said before, the usual ratio is going to be uh, 5 to 1 of T4 to the active T3. So again, just showing this uh, picture again, just to make sure you guys have a clearer idea of it. Again, iodide is being uh, brought into the follicular cells where it's being converted over by peroxidase to iodine. It gets converted, it gets organified with tyrosine, and then combined thyroglobulin to form either T4 or T3. Um, the bound thyroid hormone then is going to cross back through this apical membrane uh, and will get this thyroglobulin removed. And when that happens, um, you'll see exocytosis from the basal membrane and can be released into circulation. Um, so again, all these things um, you can end up seeing um, inhibition by high levels of iodide. So uh, certainly if you wanted to prevent conversion of T4 to T3, you can do this with things like high levels of iodide to help prevent that. So iodide is really useful in kind of preventing many of the steps in production of thyroid hormone uh, along the way. Uh, so one of the things you can also see here when the T4 is trying to be converted over um, to this deiodination process, um, you can either have uh, it being taken out, uh, the iodide being taken out of either the inner ring or the outer ring. Um, and so what happens when you have uh, removal from this inner ring is you actually end up getting this reverse T3 being formed, that which is actually not active. Over here on this outer ring when it's being removed is the actual active form of T3. So other things um, we can uh, see iodine being utilized for is with uh, certain contrast media. So this ipidate um, is uh, sometimes used as an off-label use um, for emergency treatment of thyroid storm. Again, thyroid toxic crisis um, is when you have basically just way too much T3 being activated throughout the body. Your patient's in a very hyperadrenergic state. And so by using this um, uh, more kind of potent form of iodine, you can actually end up causing uh, an inhibition of this uh, conversion from T4 to T3. Other than that, it's relatively non-toxic. Um, it can be utilized um, in conjunction with other um, kind of supportive therapy. Um, so things like dealing with um, elevated temperatures and also dealing with things like cardiac overload um, can all help to uh, manage your patient and kind of get them back uh, back to normal. So anyway, uh, that's it for uh, talk about uh, the endocrine section. Uh, certainly, if you have any questions, um, either email me or we can talk about it on Monday. Um, thanks again, and I'll see you guys then.